My early life as a ski racer was contained in two words, skiing and farming. Farming paid for the ski racing, so I was at the farm, or skiing was what I loved to do most, so I was on the mountain. After hitting a tree in Morzine a week before the World Championships in St. Moritz, Switzerland in 1974, I headed to Calgary for surgery and rehab. Once on crutches, I was speaking somewhere to pay the bills almost every other day. I was asked to speak to a group of young people, and the leader of the group was a dynamic blonde that commanded the room. After speaking, her cousin invited me to an engagement party at the home of Stan and Norma Jesperson. The blonde leader was there, and that was their daughter, Gail. She introduced me to her mom, Mrs. Jesperson, and she became a valuable 831-er. Mrs. Jesperson assisted me in helping me live my best life. I'm Jungle Jim Hunter, and you're listening to 831, Living Your Best Life, where we inspire participation, communicate precision, and empower performers to podium. And we hope that you will tell your friends and relatives to go to their favorite podcast provider or to junglejimhunter.com and write me and let me know how I can help you or to YouTube. And subscribe, download, click on like, rate and review us, and become an 831-er, someone that makes a difference in other people's lives. Well, this week, I'm going to focus all week on mothers. Yes, Mother's Day is coming up on Sunday. And so I've selected the women mothers that have made a difference in my life and been 831ers. Racing clothing in the 70s was four-way stretch material and came in basic colors, red, black, white, blue, and sometimes green. We raced around bamboo poles and bamboo gates, which were stuck in the snow and hard when you hit them. They gave you bruises on your shins and thighs and hips and your arms and shoulders and torso. Early in the week, you stayed away from the gates to heal and then attacked the gates on race day on the weekends, ignoring the pain or trying to ignore it. To find one thousandth of a second, I was always looking for better ways. Mrs. J, as she told me to call her, said, if you ever need anything, call me. You should never say that to anybody. (laughs) I had to eat and often I would arrive day or night and a hot meal was already on the table. I told her about the bruising and showed her the purple welts. I pointed out that if you can't train the way you race, attacking the gates because you are in pain, it's a disadvantage. No one on World Cup at that time had padded clothing, so I was looking for an advantage. She asked what I would do if I could do something about it. I told her I would sew four-way stretch fabric on in inch strips from the shin to the hip and from the wrist to the shoulder, then down the outside of the torso to your waist. I would cut strips of hard rubber and stuff them in the pockets. Mrs. J told me to get the fabric and the rubber strips and bring my racing pants, shell, and one-piece suit. And, well, we put them on and then we drew on them where it should go and she sewed them on. On crutches, I was not going to use them till fall training, so in fall training, it worked. I came home and we got next year's new gear. Oops, I got a problem. Mrs. J didn't hesitate a moment, and we started over again with better information. By now, we'd figured out how to do it and a faster way to do it, and I had eaten a couple of dozen meals in her home and was getting to know Gail, her daughter, and so I pushed it even further. Could you turn my new team gear into strip-away clothing so I can stay warm at the start and then just zip it up at the legs and down the arms and it drops off? This had not been invented yet either in the 70s, and so she said, sure, but... Um, do you really want to do that to brand new clothing? I said, yeah, let's do it. She was going to cut up the sleeves and up the legs and put in zippers. Yeah, it looked ugly because at that time we didn't have fabric to cover it over. I told her to do it and she did. That year, I made even greater strides forward in my results. During training and in every race, I could attack and didn't feel a thing. At the start, I watched other racers have to take their pants off and drape them around their waist trying to stay warm because they couldn't slide them over their boots. I was warm right up to the last 30 seconds. I raced all year in padded race gear and strip away warm-ups. As the season ended, I was invited to seven different ski clothing manufacturers in Europe to go and test equipment. It was a heyday of going to Europe seven times in one summer. Little did I know they were inviting me to inspect my clothing and produce the same gear for their country teams the next year. The next year, everyone had padded race clothing and strip away outer garments. I was severely reprimanded by Alpine Canada for defacing my team clothing and for looking different than everyone else because of the additional zippers and fabric. I was not trying to draw attention to myself, and I wasn't saying that the sponsor and suppliers did not have great equipment. It was simply a case of functionality. 
If the goal is to win and be the fastest down the mountain and you are standing there getting colder by the minute, then you need to do something that keeps you warm. If the goal is to be as close to the gates as possible and you have to hit them to make that happen so that you save a tenth or a thousandth of a second, how can you train avoiding hitting them and then hope that the pain repeated 40 to 60 times doesn't distract you and make you flinch? Every racer went through this. I had a lot of time with Mrs. J, and she was also a great help in helping me think through other things I needed to do. The food she had for me was great because she didn't just make what she had. She always asked me what I needed, and then did everything she could to make it so I was eating the proper fuel for training. Often on my endurance training days, I would run the 7.1 kilometers from where my parents lived to their house, enjoy a meal, and then run back doing intervals or fartlek training, and we worked on the clothing trying to make sure it worked in between the meal and the runs. My quote for the day, who's greater, the one that reaches a goal or the one that assists one to make the goal possible? The first Hall of Fame I was inducted into was the U.S. Ski Hall of Fame and Museum. I was nominated by the very demanding and successful U.S. Ski Team head coach and later director, Willie Scheffler. During the induction ceremony, Willie stated why he nominated me. And I was surprised to hear him say that it was because of the nine innovations I brought to the world of ski racing. Mrs. J wasn't there that night, but she should have been because she had built six of the nine innovations. Mrs. J didn't even ask for anything or seek credit. She just did what an 831er does, stepped forward, stepped in, and stepped up to the challenge, and with no questions asked, fulfilled what needed to be done. Mrs. Jesperson raised four children, a very successful fundraiser in oldest son, Keith. Bruce is a successful doctor. Brent is a successful property manager. And Gail, of course, eventually became my wife. When the time came to ask her to marry me, well, <laughs> it was an easy decision. <laughs> she is like her mother and also gave us four beautiful blonde haired blessings. Sunday is Mother's Day. I was so blessed to have a mother-in-law that treated me like I was one of her sons. Thank you, Mom. Thank you for listening. I hope you'll have grown and will be living your best life the next time we meet.